feel You can't go on Turn to Him When you've walked In the valley so long Turn to Him And you cry out in the night Pray for change in your life Turn to Him Whoa, turn to Him He wants you to turn to Him He's holding out His arms Turn to Him When you feel Thank you for joining me today. I'm Pastor Steve Williams, and this is Gospel of Deliverance. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your divine guidance. We thank you for the power of your word and how it changes our lives. And that is why we are here today to feel your miracle working power in our lives by your wonderful word and by the Holy Ghost. Lord Jesus, we pray that today we hear truly what you have for us, and we pray it in your name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Did you ever get spanked? because you were a smart aleck? Possibly you were impertinent with your mom or dad. You know what I'm talking about. And you felt the sting of humiliation as you were corrected. We'll make it as nice as we can make it sound. Sometimes as believers, we get too big for our britches, too heady with our thoughts and estimations of ourselves. Yet we are never above receiving help or encouragement. We are never such a strong Christian that we do not need the prayers and assistance of other followers of Yeshua. We are never so solid that we may not seek counsel of a pastor, confidant, or a friend. Standing in our own isolated advice can be very dangerous. So let us never be high-minded, but stand with the meekness and lowliness of our Savior. Let us partake of what He has for us. Title of today's sermon, Too Big for Our Britches. And so many Christians get that attitude at some point in their lives, and we pray that every pastor, teacher, preacher, evangelist, helper, a greeter, bus driver, a Bible study leader, that no one gets a big head, but instead remains in their position in which Christ has set them. We're going to be reading in Romans chapter 11, verse 20. Romans chapter 11 and verse 20. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Be not high-minded, but fear. Joseph Benson said, Thou art only what the free grace of God makes thee, and his grace is his own which he gives or withholds at pleasure, therefore be not high-minded, but fear, be not too confident of thy own strength. A holy fear is an excellent preservative against high-mindedness. Happy is the man that thus feareth always. We need not fear lest God should not be true to his word. All the danger is lest we should be false to our own. Vincent continued, 
Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left to preserving believers of entering into his rest, we should come short of it. Through not continuing in the faith, grounded and settled, but being moved therefrom and from the hope of the gospel. What truth, what insight is given in just those few short words by Brother Benson that we have to be careful always of our position with Christ that we do not become, well, high-minded or too big for our britches. And I want us to get to that point, this 16th century saying that basically we're still a child and we're strapping on our father's pants. Friends, we will never be able to wear the garments of our Father in heaven. And therefore, we need to keep a circumspect view of who we are. And that must also be for who we are in the gospel and who we are in the church, who we are in our group of friends and family, and all of the members of our local body of Christ. We've got to maintain a proper sense of who we are. Proverbs 26 and 12. Proverbs 26 and 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. The biblical illustrator had this to say. The folly of self-conceit. The scriptures are full of denunciations against the self-sufficiency of man. The writings of Solomon are conspicuous for expressions which stigmatize the absurdity and the guilt of a self-willed, self-sufficient spirit. Here he says that when a man is wise in his own conceit, there is so little hope of his reformation that even a fool would be a more promising subject for moral and intellectual discipline. Teachable and honest mediocrity is always attended with a fair hope of improvement, but that very quality which may preserve even to dullness itself, the chance of elimination is necessarily wanting to him who is wise in his own conceit, namely a tractable and docile temper. Whenever a feeling of self-sufficiency takes possession of a mind, even of more than ordinary strength, there is danger of its shutting out all prospect of effectual improvement. What exertions will be made by one who is content with his acquisitions? To him, who knows better than the rest of mankind, instruction or advice must needs appear impertinent. That's the way our children sometimes become. You remember your own lives where you thought you knew better than mom or dad. You knew what was the right and proper time for you to go to bed. You knew which chores you shouldn't have to do. You knew how much your allowance should be. All of those things and more we got too big for our britches. Even as we became young people, yes, even young people in the Lord, 16, 17, and 18, we thought we had the world by the tail. We probably thought we had all understanding that we needed. Likewise, as believers, we have to be careful of those same feelings, those same ideas that rest in self-conceit. For years sometimes a believer will rest in their lack of knowledge. But as they grow, as they study, as they pray, as they choose books to read, sometimes at the suggestion of their pastor or an evangelist 
or a Bible study leader, a Sunday school teacher. They'll read the book, and then they'll read another, and before you know it, they've got together a pretty decent library of Christian classics, and I'm not discouraging that. I'm saying it's a proper part of our growth in Christ. But beware, because as we gain knowledge, we must be careful not to gain any conceit or an overestimation of our abilities in Christ Jesus. Let's read this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. That's the words of Apostle Paul, directed by God the Holy Ghost, to describe what he was going through. Because of all that had been revealed to him, there was the danger of thinking of himself above his actual station in life. John Darby wrote, The heart only walks safely when the flesh is bridled. Let's mark that saying. The heart only walks safely when the flesh is bridled. And he continued saying, So practically nullified that we are not conscious of it as active in us when we wish to be wholly given to God. And to think of him and with him according to our measure. Three times, like the Lord, with reference to the cup he was to drink, the apostle asks him that the thorn may be taken away. But the divine life is fashioned in the putting off of self. And imperfect as we are, this putting off as to practice, that which as to truth, if we look at our standing in Christ, we have put off, is wrought by our being made conscious of the humiliating unsuitableness of this flesh, which we like to gratify to the presence of God and the service to which we are called. Happy for us when it is by and of prevention and not by the humiliation of a fall, as was the case with Peter. The difference is plain. There it was self-confidence mingled with self-will in spite of the Lord's warnings. Here, though, still the flesh, the occasion was the revelations which had been made to Paul. If we learn the tendency of the flesh in the presence of God, we come out of it humble, and we escape humiliation. But in general, and we may say in some respects with all, we have to experience the revelations that lift us up to God, whatever their measure may be, and we have to experience what the vessel is in which it is contained by the pain it gives us through the sense of what it is. I do not say through falls, God and his government knows how to unite suffering for Christ and the discipline in the flesh in the same circumstance. The apostle preached, if he was despised in his preaching, it was truly for the Lord that he suffered. Nevertheless, the same thing disciplined the flesh and prevented the apostle priding himself on the revelations he enjoyed and the consequent power with which he unfolded the truth. Does that sound like something that maybe you've went through? Maybe you became high-minded because, again, you've read a lot, you've studied, you've prayed, you've received from God, but as so many times before and as the Bible warned, you got too big for your britches. And you didn't need anybody else. You didn't need anyone to tell you anything. You sat down in the chair, and what the pastor had to say, well, it just wasn't pertinent to you anymore because you already knew it. 
what that brother in the Bible study had to say didn't mean anything because you were above it. And you sure didn't need to seek out any kind of counsel. You didn't need to seek out counsel uh, for your lifestyle, for a job choice, uh, where to put your money, what to buy or not to buy. You didn't even want to seek wise counsel because you didn't want to be told what to do because, well, you thought you were filling the britches of a real adult believer. Yet, that is so far from the truth because humility is what drives the mature believer. And I pray today that every one of us that has gotten caught by that bug of self-confidence, that we quickly put it aside and we ask for the Lord's forgiveness. Amen. Successful from the cradle to the grave. Watch the curves, fill the tunnel. Never falter, never quail. Keep your hand upon the throttle and your eye upon the rail. Blessed Savior, that will guide us till we reach that blissful shore. Where the angels wait to join us In our praise forevermore You will roll up grades of trial You will cross the bridge of strife See that Christ is your conductor On this lightning train of life Always mindful of obstruction do your duty, never fail. Keep your hand upon the throttle and your eyes upon the rail. Thus it save you that will guide us till we reach that blissful shore where the angels wait to join us in thy praise forevermore. Look for storms of wind and rain On a field, our curb or trestle They will almost ditch your train Put your trust alone in Jesus Never falter, never fail Keep your hand upon the throttle And your eye upon the rail Blessed Savior, Thou wilt guide us Till we reach that blissful shore Where the angels wait to join us In Thy praise forevermore As you roll across the trestle Spanning Jordan's swelling tide You behold the Union Depot into which your train will glide There you meet the superintendent God the Father, God the Son With a hearty 
joyous plotted, weary pilgrim, welcome home. Blessed Savior, Thou wilt guide us till we reach that blissful shore, where the angels wait to join us in Thy praise forevermore. Jerusalem. Tickets, please. Let's read in Philippians 2 and verse 3, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. I want to read from the commentary of John Gill, and he said about words merely, otherwise they were to strive for the faith of the gospel the purity of gospel ordinances, worship and discipline. But the apostle would not have them strive merely to carry a point determined on, without having any regard to reason and truth, or yielding to the infirmities of the weak, which is the case and conduct of contentious persons, than which nothing can be more contrary to the spirit of the gospel or the peace of churches. The apostle adds, or vain glory, for where this is predominant, persons will always be singular in their sentiments and never relinquish them. Let what reason soever be given against them, nor will they give way the judgment of others, but right or wrong will have their own wills. Boy, if that doesn't fit the image of a person who's too big for their britches, I don't know what does. Thank you, Brother Gill. We're going to do it right or wrong. We're going to have our own way. Because often this self-will, we think that it's just not seeking the counsel of others. We're not seeking the agreement of others and saying, listen, I know you've been a believer longer than I have. I'd like to find out what your thoughts on this. We're thinking of doing this. We're thinking of buying that. But you don't do it because, well, you're too big for your britches. Oh, I've been there. And I know you have too. I just pray that we haven't given in to it that we have sought wise counsel, that we have looked to those around us to pray with us, to seek the truth of God, to seek the way of God, and to know that self-reliance is dangerous, self-will dangerous more still. So it is with us today, friends, the ever-present cause of pride, which assaults in our very strength, which has been given to us through wonderful workings of the Holy Ghost and by the Word of God. If we get too big for our britches, God Almighty will apply to our backside, just as our parents did when we played the know-it-all. Our striving must be to advance with Jesus in grace, but also in humility. Growing up in Him, but diminishing our human fleshy self each day. That has to be our way. 
That has to be how we proceed with God. That can be our only true strength. The danger of being too big for our britches is that we will go off and not perform the will of God. And then we will quickly find ourselves disciplined by the hand of our Lord. We will find that God has given us a royal spanking because we've done something that has offended him. We did not seek wise counsel. Every good pastor knows that they have someone that they can go to, someone else. It may be someone that they have known for a long time. Maybe they went to Bible college or seminary. Maybe they attended the same church and they became assistant pastors at the same time. And then one left that church and became a pastor somewhere else while the other stayed and assumed the reins of that body. But they seek one another's counsel. Maybe it's an elder pastor. Maybe it's an elder of the church, and they trust their prayer time. They trust their understanding of the word, and they go to them. Maybe you're just a, a youth pastor or an assistant pastor, associate pastor, a Bible school teacher, a Sunday school teacher, a prayer leader. Maybe you greet people. I don't care what it is. If you're driving the bus, you're never too big in God to receive counsel, to ask for prayer. And you know what? We're silly if we don't seek. We're silly if we don't seek that counsel. We are ridiculous. We look the part of the fool if we do not seek that wise counsel of God. To verify that what we're feeling and what we are getting from the Word fits the circumstance. Sometimes we get so out of hand, we disobey God directly just like we did our parents. I'll give you an example. We may find ourselves praying to God for something particular. And the Lord gives us permission to purchase this thing or to do this thing. doesn't matter what it is. I mean, it could be a new car. It could be uh, a new house. It might be a second house. It could be a third car. No, no matter. But we've prayed and God has given us permission but he has told us to wait. Maybe he told us to wait 30 days, maybe uh, six months or a year or two years, whatever it might be. Maybe we felt impressed that it was going to be a new house and so we would wait five years. And the day of our freedom, as though it were the year of jubilation, the second we are able, we go and we do it. We do not return to the Lord and say, Father, I've waited the appropriate time. Is it okay if I go and I do this or I make that purchase? And we go right ahead. And then the Lord says to us, Bye his discipline by that dropping of the pants and the holy belt of God comes down on our backside and tells us listen son listen daughter I told you this but you didn't even seek my permission once again you didn't even say Father, you told me that it was okay to do this today. Is that still go? 
I'm waiting for your word, my dear Heavenly Father. See, it's all about humility versus that self-sured determination that I'm going to have what I want to have. I'm going to have things the way I want them to be. And that is being too big for our britches, and that's when we get in trouble because we've not taken the time because we want what we want just like a rebellious child. Boy, I'm telling you what. I've seen my own son, the second he has the freedom, the second that he has it, boom, he's off like a dart. Maybe that permission was given, and the second it ticks to it, there is no waiting. He's gone lickety-split. Oh, but I love it. I said I love it when my son says, Dad, you told me I could do this at this appointed time. You told me. Is it okay if I go and do it now? How it warms my heart, and I know it has to as parents. It has to warm your heart. It has to make you feel so proud and so good. When your child comes to you and says, I know you gave me permission, Dad. But is it still okay? May I go forward? Friends, that is that is what we need to be before Christ. That's truly being an adult. Because as that beautiful song says, I can't even walk without him holding my hand. Friend in Christ. Let us never be too big for our britches. Let us always seek to be humble before Christ. Because doing anything else brings us into danger of real discipline. That discipline may come in the form of God taking something away. Maybe that something that we had asked for and we had pleaded for, he may take it away. Or the freedom that he had given us, he may take away. We may be pummeled in our finances. We might be stricken in our health. All in God's plan to bring us to a place of humility to bring us back down to our knees and recognizing that it's by God's grace. Regardless of who we think we are in Him, we have to make sure that we are humble before Christ. No matter how many thousands of hours we have prayed, no matter how many times we have read through the Bible, no matter how many hours we have offered in study, no matter how many times we have either preached, led a prayer meeting, went to a Bible study, or have attended thousands and thousands of services, regardless, we must be humble before God. No matter if we have a library the size of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, no matter if we have read them all, it does not matter if we have read, read the works of A.W. Pink, C.H. Spurgeon, Andrew Murray, E.M. Bounds, and so many more. It doesn't matter what we've accomplished. It doesn't matter if we've went to the biggest conferences. It doesn't matter if we've had the biggest following on social platforms because what we've said is popular. Friends, what matters is that we are humble before God. Mark the two disciples, the two apostles of Christ, Peter and Paul. Peter who remained self-willed, even with the warnings of Christ, he remained self-willed, and there was a fall. The Apostle Paul, he recognized the possibility of the fall, 
and he circumvented it because he went to Christ. He circumvented it because he went to Christ and said, I'm going to rely solely upon you now. I understand now that what is besetting me is to keep me humble. It's not just something that's going on that's common to man. It's not just something. It's not just that I had a flat tire. It's not just that uh, I lost $25 when I needed it for lunch to take my brother in the Lord out. It's not just this or that, but it is God's providential will in our lives to keep us humble before Him. Mark the difference between the two approaches and let us ever choose the fact that His grace is always sufficient and that we must be humble and we must understand what God will go and do on our behalf. He loves us so much, and He wants us in heaven so much. His whole desire, all of His plans to that end, to get you to heaven, to get me to heaven, that He will break our pride down. So friend, today, if pride has seated itself in your life, I pray that God will discipline you as he's done me, as he did the Apostle Paul, as he did the Apostle Peter. We're no better than they, and they received the chastisement of the Lord. Let us never be high-minded, thinking that we don't need the prayers of others, thinking that we do not need to seek wise counsel of God through others. That we don't need to simply ask, would you pray with me about this? See what God has to say. Maybe the Lord will give you a scripture to share with me. Then maybe the permission comes, but don't run off like an anxious child. How ridiculous we look sometimes as adults when we act like a child. We need to put away the childish things. Faith as a child, yes strongly believing, undeterred, but an adult as in our faith, in the way we feel. Let us stop this idea. I don't need anybody else. I've got big shoulders. I don't cry anymore because I learned that life is not that hard or I learn to shield myself. Friends, none of these ways or means make us big in Christ. They simply just make us too big for our britches. It's time to put it aside. It's time for us to really grow up and realize we'll never fill our Father's shoes. Amen. I remember my son, Stephen, he was still a little tight, and he got into my big size 12 dress shoes, and he was trying to walk around, and he was just pulling them with his little feet tucked in as far as he could toward the front, and it was so ridiculous to see him walking around, but he wanted to be like me, and often our desire and the self-will that we end up obtaining and that self-confidence that we get comes from a desire to make God proud of us as his child. But as we get past childhood, and we're no longer just that new born-again babe, but we've studied the Word, that doesn't look good anymore. It's presumptuous. It's self-willed. And now for my son Stephen, in his 12th year, going on 13, instead of him wanting to hop in those big shoes, sometimes he thinks that he actually fills them. And I'm not talking about the real shoe size. Dear mothers, your shoe size could be a size four and a half. 
and your daughter or your son couldn't fill them. Because you've been praying a lifetime, you've found out that high-mindedness does not work, but submission to Christ and seeking the prayers and wise counsels of other mature believers is the road to happiness and the surety of performing God's will. Let us keep that in mind as we go forward from this day, from this hour. Let it be so. Let it be our desire to be his true child and humble before him. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord God, for reaching down and healing those that have a need right now. Some are discouraged in their mind. Some are discouraged in their bodies because they've been sick for so long. They've not yet returned to normal. Maybe they've went through COVID-19 and survived, but they're still weakened. They're not back to 100%. Maybe someone has lost a loved one, a dear friend. And God, we pray for the solace for their hearts and minds. For those that are facing other diseases, tragedies, we pray for them today. Those that are facing decisions and desires, we pray, Lord God, for them. Not only that you will answer, but that they will seek wise counsel. And that not only when they get permission, but they will ask again to verify that you have said, Go, my child, and do. Take your pleasure. Lord, this is our desire to be that good child before you. And we pray for all of this, and I know there is so much more, and we lift it all up to you in an unspoken manner for your hand, for your touch. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with me today. I pray that you have a great day in Christ, and remember, don't ever get too big for your britches. God bless, and goodbye. Got a feeling someday soon we'll be leaving. From what I'm seeing, I'm believing it won't be very long. The signs are clear. The time is near. When Jesus calls us home, we're out of here. Gone in the twinkling of an